Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. Some real talk about celebrating Thanksgiving this year. How artificial intelligence is being used to recreate smells from history. And Bunny the Talking Dog, the latest viral star on TikTok. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. All right, Thanksgiving is coming up here in the U.S., and while being bombarded with headlines, CDC recommendations, and local alerts that remind you how much you should not travel this Thanksgiving and only spend the holiday with people already in your household, more than likely you, or at least some people that you know, are making plans to break or bend those recommendations in some way. Now, personally, I do think that the best strategy is to not have indoor gatherings with people outside of our households, but I also recognize that just saying that and nothing else is like abstinence-only education. And as someone who grew up in Texas, a place with some of the strictest abstinence-only education regulations and some of the highest rates of teen pregnancy, I know that simply telling someone not to do something without giving them any other education or advice on what to do if they do it is not useful. So whether it's useful for you or useful in sharing with someone you are trying to convince to be more cautious, here are some things to be aware of and some tips for still getting to celebrate in some way without putting yourself, your loved ones, and your community at huge risk. Starting with this from Wired, quote, CDC Director Robert Redfield warned on a call with governors earlier this month that small group gatherings were driving up infections. We're seeing a lot of transmission amongst families and friends in small groups. Neil Segal, assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the University of Maryland, says he adds that the social interactions people prize during the holidays put people at particular risk, from cooking together in close proximity to multi-generational gatherings. All of these things put us at increased risk of transmission of airborne infectious disease, he says, end quote. So again, the safest option is to not have an indoor gathering with people outside of your household. As you weigh your options for where that leaves you, or how you might inadvisably bend the rules, the first thing to remember is that almost everything with regards to COVID-19 is about risk reduction. There is no one thing that you can do that will make you completely safe. So you can't just do one thing and think that you're fine. And by the same token, deciding not to take any precautions because none of them are foolproof is also an inadvisable strategy. Over on Kotki.org, Jason has been referencing the Swiss cheese model a lot lately, and just generally sharing some really great resources with hard data on transmission and risks, so keep an eye out over there. But the Swiss cheese model is basically the idea that if you have one slice of Swiss cheese, something can totally get through the holes. Even with two slices of Swiss cheese, something could get through, but the more slices you layer on top of each other, the less likely anything will be able to penetrate the holes of the Swiss cheese. So, for example, if you go get a regular PCR test, you know, the nasal swab, a few days before Thanksgiving and it comes back negative, that is not your ticket to go have a maskless indoor celebration with a bunch of other people. That test was just one slice of Swiss cheese. And the holes are things like a false negativity rate and the chance that you got infected in between taking the test and getting your results. That doesn't mean don't get the test, it just means you need more slices of Swiss cheese. Make sure you're still wearing a mask and social distancing in your everyday activities. If you're able to, self-quarantine in between taking the test and getting your results, and in between getting your results and attending your Thanksgiving celebration. And by the way, even though the rapid tests that are becoming more available can give you your results within the hour and therefore cut out that time of needing to quarantine while you await results, they are still far more inaccurate than the regular ones. Now, other slices of cheese or precautions to take would include significantly reducing the number of people in attendance, under 10 if possible. Bonus points if you keep anyone over 65 or otherwise high risk as a virtual attendee. Hold the event outdoors, or, you know, maybe in a garage with the door open. Limit the amount of time that you spend there, or the amount of time spent indoors. 
For example, stopping by to say hello for 15 minutes is way better than staying for four hours or all night. Travel via car, not by plane, bus, or public transportation. Better yet, don't attend anything that would require you to travel across city or state lines. Although if you do, check the rate of transmission in your community, the community that you'll be traveling to, and the communities any other guests are coming from. And or consider quarantining both before you leave and when you get there. Although that's a bit late to do for Thanksgiving, but could be a tip for future holidays. Olga Kazan from The Atlantic notes, quote, It's safer, but still not entirely safe, to gather inside if your area is seeing 10 or fewer new cases a day per 100,000 people. Right now, that excludes most major metropolitan areas in the United States, as well as plenty of rural counties. End quote. And crucially, if you wake up feeling sick, even if you think it's just allergies, don't go. Also, wear masks when you're not eating. And that's one that makes this kind of celebration so dangerous. Wearing masks when you're indoors with people outside of your household makes a huge difference in transmission risk. But if you're gathering to share a meal, masks will be off for most or all of the time. If you can't tell by the tone of my voice, I personally, based on what I've been reading from the experts and the numbers that I've been tracking, think that the best thing to do this year is go virtual or only celebrate with the people already in your household. The one possible exception would be if you've already formed a pod, or this can be something to consider for upcoming holidays. Lauren Sauer, director of operations for Johns Hopkins Office of Critical Event Preparedness and Response, says that if you decide to form a holiday pod, make sure you have an open and honest discussion a few weeks ahead of time in order to come to an agreement on precautions. Like what precautions will you all be taking in the lead up to the event, like avoiding crowds or quarantining? And what precautions will you take at the event? Will you wear masks when not eating? Will everyone have to get a test beforehand? Will windows stay open? Pods still fall under the Swiss cheese model, in a way. Just because you all say that you're in a pod, it doesn't mean you're all safe to hang out whenever, if you're not all keeping clear and strict communication about your risks and precautions. So let's say you've had the hard talk with your loved ones that you're not doing a Thanksgiving together in person this year, and you don't have a holiday pod. Here are some ways to still celebrate together. Try doing a video call while you cook your separate meals. Maybe even share recipes so that you're all cooking and then eating the same thing. Although, as folks on Twitter have joked about the strategy, even if your grandma shares her family recipe, that doesn't mean you'll end up eating the same thing. No one can cook it like grandma does. There's also a lot of people talking about doing contactless potlucks where everyone will be assigned the same dishes as usual, but will drop them off at each other's houses ahead of dinner, and then they'll all join together virtually on a video call when they eat. And if you're used to cooking for a huge group, the website Kitchen has a number of articles with tips on planning a menu for just one or two people, which I will put in the show notes. Going along that thread, tomorrow I'm going to talk about tips for enjoying the holidays if you will be truly spending them all alone this year. And it's possible. Trust me, I have spent most Christmases alone for the past several years, and I also love Christmas more than most people that I know. But that's tomorrow. Today, I just want to end by re-emphasizing, despite everything I laid out here, that all experts are recommending we not spend time indoors with people outside of our households. Celebrate virtually. You know, think of it as postponing instead of canceling. Start new traditions that are COVID safe. Not doing an in-person gathering with people outside of your household does not mean canceling Thanksgiving. It just means not having an in-person gathering with people outside of your household. Starting a home workout routine can be intimidating and tough to stick to. But with FitBod, you can get a truly personalized fitness program that adapts as you go. FitBod is a smart fitness app that takes all the guesswork out of planning your workouts. Their algorithm factors in your goals, experience level, equipment, workout duration, and muscle recovery to intelligently craft the perfect total body workout program just for you. One of my favorite parts of the app is that every single exercise has both text instructions and a video 
that you can easily reference either before or during your workout so you know you're actually getting the correct form or adding new moves to your repertoire. FitBod combines the knowledge of fitness pros with a powerful machine learning algorithm to give you a workout program that maximizes your results. And the workouts are balanced to avoid overworking muscles with varied exercises to keep you sharp. Personalized training can be tough on the budget, but FitBod is only $9.99 a month or $59.99 a year. Plus, you can try one month of workouts absolutely free. Get a personalized fitness plan that helps you work out smarter at fitbod.me slash kotke. Try FitBod for free for one month when you sign up today at fitbod.me slash kotke. That's one free month when you sign up at fitbod.me slash kotke. In discussions about investing, experts always note that it's important to have a diversified portfolio. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, that kind of thing. But if you've ever looked at a breakdown of the most successful portfolios, you'll typically see a diversified set of real estate. So why isn't it one of the first asset classes you consider when you're looking to diversify? Simple. It hasn't been available to investors like you and me until now, thanks to Fundrise. They make it easy for all investors to diversify by building building you a portfolio of institutional quality real estate investments. So whether you're just starting to invest in real estate or looking to add more, our friends at Fundrise have you covered. Here's how. Fundrise is an investing platform that makes investing in high-quality, high-potential real estate as easy as investing in your favorite stock or mutual fund. Whether you're looking to add stable cash flow via dividends or prefer long-term growth through appreciation, Fundrise has you covered. To date, Fundrise manages more than $1 billion in assets for 150,000-plus investors, and Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages all of their real estate projects. And with their easy-to-use website, you can track your portfolio's performance and watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via asset updates. Start building your better portfolio today. Get started at Fundrise.com slash Kotke to have your first 90 days of advisory fees waived. That's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash Kotke to have your first 90 days of advisory fees waived. Fundrise.com slash Kotke. I feel like the consensus is that much of history probably smelled pretty crappy. I mean, literally. Like, anytime someone is looking at history through rose-colored glasses, it's helpful to get a dose of reality by remembering how much it probably stunk, no matter how beautiful it may look in a portrait or as recreated on screen. Now, there's a bit of a debate here about the accuracy of how bad different time periods actually smelled, And maybe we will soon find out the truth because a new interdisciplinary team funded by the European Union is using artificial intelligence to recreate historical scents. Quoting Forbes, Dubbed Odoropa, the consortium boasts a multidisciplinary array of European scientists and scholars spanning history, art history, computational linguistics, computer vision, semantic web, museology, heritage science, and chemistry. Over the next three years, these specialists will collaborate on novel methods in sensory mining and olfactory heritage science, aiming to construct an encyclopedia of historical smells, scents, odors, based on collections of digital texts and images. They will then work with chemists, artists, and perfumers to reconstruct a selection of the smells documented in their database. Artificial intelligence fits into this picture via computational linguistics and computer vision. AI algorithms will be used to mine historical texts and images for references to smells and odors, which will then be collated into an online encyclopedia of smell heritage. These algorithms will also scan for references to sensory qualities, emotional significances, and social meanings of smells, allowing the Odoropa team to build a multidimensional description of smells that spans decades and centuries. End quote. The ultimate goal will be that encyclopedia of smell heritage, which can be mined for use in museums and heritage sites and probably art installations as well. A previous blog post on the Odoropa site mentions a project that reconstructed historical scents associated with historical artworks that were used to give a more interesting and inclusive tour for the blind and vision impaired at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam just before lockdown. 
And to be honest, that type of application didn't occur to me at all when I first read about Odoropa, but I think it's absolutely awesome. You know, combining scent and storytelling for accessibility in art appreciation is super rad. AI is helping us engage with history in so many ways that we never could before, and despite my joking about the smelliness of the past, I am absolutely here for this. So I was scrolling through TikTok the other day, and I came across this video talking about a dog having an existential crisis. I watched it, and it's a dog named Bunny, whose owners have tripped her out with a big floor mat of buttons that are each associated with a word, so Bunny the dog can step on a button or a series of buttons to make a phrase. And in this particular video, Bunny pressed who and then this as she looked at herself in a nearby mirror placed on the floor. Who this? Her owner, kind of shocked by the question, explained to Bunny that the mirror image was herself, also Bunny. Bunny then walked in circles for a moment before returning to the mat and pressing help. Bunny is a sheep -a doodle with 5 million followers on TikTok and has spawned countless parody videos exaggerating her button-created questions that do quite frequently seem to veer into the existential, asking things like why her owner loves her, as well as more practical questions like where the humans of the house poop and convincing them to take her on more walks. Bunny's owner, Alexis Devine, has emphasized both in videos and interviews that she doesn't really think Bunny is talking, but that it's more muscle memory and operant conditioning. She also notes that, of course, she shares the most seemingly impressive or entertaining clips for TikTok. There are way more accidental button presses or boring moments that don't make the cut because she's just sharing them for fun. But the actual button mat is for more than just fun. Devine and Bunny are part of a study called They Can Talk with the Comparative Cognition Lab at the University of California, San Diego. Devine trained Bunny to use buttons from her earliest puppy days, starting with just one outside button by the door. Now, at 16 months old, Bunny has been trained on over 70 buttons. And while Devine may cherry-pick which clips get posted on TikTok, for the purposes of the study, a camera is pointed at the button mat at all times and sent to the lab for analysis. The study includes over 70 animals, not just dogs, but also cats and horses, and their goal is a better understanding of animals' communication and cognition. They're less interested in how many of those words the animals can memorize, and more in aspects of cognition that are typically thought to be uniquely human, the ability to make observations, form narratives, and sense temporal and spatial displacement. Quoting The Verge, when Bunny asks, where dad, does that mean she has a sense of spatial displacement, where she is aware of dad and acknowledging that he is not present in the room with her? When another dog presses water outside, is that an observation about the rain, or is it a request? One of the most interesting recent introductions to Bunny's board at the prompting of researchers has been words that are related to concepts of time, including morning, evening, yesterday, and tomorrow. There's not much known about how dogs might conceptualize time. Lisa Gunter, a research fellow at Arizona State University who has worked with dogs with separation anxiety, thinks dogs likely have a concept of duration, but who's to say how they would describe it? End quote. While sometimes the buttons Bunny presses in order do seem uncanny, like when she got a foxtail spine stuck in her paw, or when she told her owner to be quiet, both the researchers and Bunny's owners are very careful not to believe anything too quickly. The Verge notes the famous case of Clever Hans, quote, the 20th century horse who could apparently provide answers to simple math questions by tapping his hoof. Upon further investigation, it turned out Hans wasn't doing any arithmetic, but was instead reading subtle cues from whoever was questioning him to know when to stop tapping, end quote. But Gunter sees this study as different. For one, the animals are being kept in their home environments, and two, dogs at least already have a very close and shared relationship with humans going back thousands of years. 
She sees this study less about trying to get inside the minds of dogs or create some kind of party trick, and more about bridging gaps between human and dog communication so that both sides are better able to communicate wants and needs on a level that's usually reserved for a very experienced trainer. The study that Bunny is involved in, by the way, is an open study that anyone can join, or any of your pets, I suppose, so if you're interested, link in the show notes. Regardless, though, check out Bunny's videos on TikTok and Instagram. They are an excellent distraction from doom scrolling. That's it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I'm going to go see if Odoropa can recreate the scent of inside a crowded bar on a Saturday night. Because, you know, as unappealing as it may be, it might as well be historical at this point. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you again tomorrow.